to worship. Uh, what did uh, Brittany say that uh, she was doing this week? Um, what time is it? 9.30. On uh, what day? Monday morning. <sighs> I used to think that uh, living in the fear of the Lord is like driving down the street while watching the policeman in your rear view mirror. Uh, but I read something different. Actually, there's a better picture for the fear of the Lord. It's like a teenage girl who suddenly spots her father's car in her rear view mirror. <laughs> Seeing him back there puts her on notice to be on her best behavior. Use her blinkers, stop at the yellow light, and uh, keep both hands on the wheel. But it also tells her that Father cares enough to follow her. It tells her that she's safe. Her father isn't trying to trap her, uh, trick her, ha, ha, ha. but he's trying to help her develop good habits. It's not just to be careful on this trip, but to obey the law and stay safe until she gets home. She's driving on her own, but not completely on her own. So it is for the people of God. The fear of the Lord means we live life with our Heavenly Father always in a rear view mirror. We glance up and see His brilliant holiness, but also His care and love. A response, the fear of the Lord, is a mix of reference, trust, and love. When I follow you, um, it's uh, what I want you to think of. Reference, trust, and love. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and approach to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they're doing evil. The preacher Solomon's admonitions and imperatives are as much for us, we Christians, as they were for the people who lived in his day. According to Derek Kidner, who uh, wrote a commentary, they are for the, quote, well-meaning person who likes a good sing and turns up cheerfully enough to church, but who listens with half an ear and never quite gets around to what he has volunteered to do for God. When we consider the holiness of God and compare it with our own unholy worship, it is a wonder that any of us are still alive. This is part of what it means for us to, in our case, know Christ. Our imperfect worship is accepted by the Father because of the perfect worship offered by the Son. When we know that even our worship is forgiven, then we can approach God with joyful confidence. Notice the words in the verse. Rather than saying, if I worship the right way, then God will accept me. We say, oh, I'm already accepted through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and now it is my privilege to worship God the way he wants to be worshipped. According to Proverbs, a fool, uh, some of the traditions uh, of a fool, does not pursue wisdom at all. Manifests a spiritual, not mental, problem. Enjoys his foolishness. 
has no reverence for the truth and actually is a menace, a menace to society. We need to avoid offering the sacrifice of fools when we come to church. For they do not know they are doing evil. Uh, conversely, they are doing what is evil when they come to worship because they don't realize that God is watching, even watching, our hearts. Do not be quick with your mouth or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. The first caution against hate, uh, haste addresses the mouth. Do not be quick with your mouth. The second addresses the heart. Um, or impulsive in thought, um, literally, uh, it's impulsive in heart. Hastiness in prayer, I think it's talking about prayer. Hastiness in prayer devalues God. Uh, we always pray when we come to church. I, I like it when we pray, uh, when you come to church, but it gives us opportunities for keeping a heart clean after God, showing our devotion to God, confessing our dependence on God, but it can manifest a grab bag that we think that God only exists to satisfy our own ends. Solomon indicated that God's in heaven above the sun, above this world, beyond the sun. His greatness and power exceeds anything in the world. And biblical prayer does not seek to manipulate God. Um, uh, I'm reminded of a story, uh, I've heard it before, and um, um, Grandma came to visit before Christmas. And... Um, Billy often prayed, Dear God, please give me a bike. Amen. He prayed it every night, but especially on Christmas Eve. Dear God, please give me a bicycle. Amen. And um, his mother came to him. Uh, Billy, uh, don't you know that God is not deaf? Uh, he can hear you fine. And um, Billy said, Yes. Grandma doesn't hear so well. Grandma was staying with him, right? For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. You have to look at verse 7 to catch the meaning of this verse. Uh, For in many dreams and in many words there is futility. Rather, fear God. It links the chatter of fools with the re, uh, unreality of dreams. It seems to say, by its very quantity, excessive talk leads to foolish talk, just as an excess of anxiety leads to troubled dreams. Uh, I um, don't remember uh, my dreams, so I'm not a good example, but I'm told that um, if you're stressed, uh, most people have bad dreams. Uh, you have anxious dreams. Um, Mrs. Johnston used to have dreams of um, um, being chased by spiders and snakes. Um, that uh, didn't last for long. Uh, uh, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, uh, she just got over it. But um, if you're anxious, fearful, you probably, in most cases, will dream about having anxiety. 
just as excessive, foolish talk when you pray. Um, it's better to pray quickly. Um, I was uh, told, counseled, uh, and I did this for a while, but I stopped doing it. Um, I was counseled to pray myself to sleep. So I would start praying, and um, I would think of all kinds of things, because uh, um, I wasn't asleep yet. And um, I stopped that because um, I would pray for uh, everything and uh, anything. And um, uh, I was a living example of what you're not supposed to do. Work leads to many dreams. Foolishness needs, uh, leads to many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Um, pay your vow. See how many times a fool is listed? Why was he listed? Because he talks too much. Solomon now moves to speech that is used in the temple. Vow. Uh, even Christians make vows. Uh, Acts 21, 23. Uh, so, we, uh, so do what we tell you. There are four men who are with us who have taken and made a vow. Vows in the Old Testament primarily involve commitments for giving God things or promises. The command in verse 4 is a reminder to keep your word to God. God believed you and God still believes you when you promise that particular promise. You had better keep it. The example is Jonah 2.9 But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. We wouldn't know... Um, that he vowed a vow, if not for this verse, because it was never talked about. Like when Jonah apparently made God a promise to go to Nineveh, which was that way. And which way did he go? This way, 180 degrees. Um, I was going to say 360 degrees, but uh, that's not right. He went 180 degrees opposite. Well, notice, it is better that you do not vow than vow and not pay. God listens while we pray. God pays attention while we pray. And only a fool makes God promises that he cannot or should not make. Vows are voluntary. There is a danger of attempting to offer bribes to God, especially in distressing times. We've all heard stories. Um, oh, I uh, promised to God that um, I would do something and um, if he saved me. The most famous uh, real case is Martin Luther. Martin Luther had uh, different terrors, and he was terrified of lightning. Uh, to be stuck out in a storm is the worst thing he could imagine. And surely, he got stuck out in a storm by himself and vowed to God to change his career from being a lawyer to being a monk if he would live. In that case, we all uh, thank God for uh, his career change. But uh, I do not advise. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think that you could um, and should do uh, promises to God that you're not going to keep. Know that God expects you to keep your commitments. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. 
and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God, um, uh, read a um, uh, pastor or priest, that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Your speech may cause you to sin before God. Perhaps the voluntary offering vowed to a temple priest is unfulfilled. Oh, it was a mistake. That's the most common lie told. Oh, uh, I didn't mean it. Um, I uh, didn't mean to say it, is the worshiper's evasion. But God sees, and a careless approach to him, that's what we're talking about, uh, being careless with your words to God on high. A careless approach to him may bring his anger to our words and our works. For many dreams and many words, they're his futility. Rather, fear God. Uh, what, um, what I connected verse uh, 3 to. This is a connection to verse 3. People have a tendency to carry their fantasies and talk without thinking much and it extends to when we pray. We shouldn't pray that way. We shouldn't talk to God and make commitments or promises or say anything that we don't mean. The remedy is to fear God. But someone who takes, uh, be someone who takes God seriously and let your words and actions model your perspectives about God. I've heard it said, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And I believe it more and more for us. The fear of the Lord includes, the fear of the Lord at the uh, beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord includes trusting God completely. That's found in Psalm 115, verse 11. Delighting in God's word. That's found in Psalm 112, 1. Keeping, uh, keeping to obey God's word. That's found in Psalm 119, 63. Consistently hating evil. That's found in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. And hoping in God's loving kindness, commitments. That's found in Psalm 147, 11. What's that? Until about the year 1900, you could have shown that picture and um, folks could have no idea, no imagination that that was a treadmill. Because in Victorian England, treadmills were not found in air-conditioned health clubs. They were found in prisons. Treadmills or tread wheels. I found an a image um, of the treadmill were used in servitude as a form of punishment. Some tread wheels uh, were productive, grinding wheat or transporting water, but others were primarily punitive, punishment-oriented in nature. Prisoners were punished by spending the bulk of their day walking up an inclined plane, knowing that all their hard labor was for nothing. The only hope the prisoner had was that in some day in the future, he would have paid his debt to society and would be set free. He couldn't even look at his labor at the end of the day and know that, if nothing else, he would have been productive. As you struggle with sinning in your life, 
Remember that Christ has set you free indeed, and that you're no longer sentenced to be chained to the treadmill of sin and failure. He has paid the ransom demand for your release from sin, and you're now walking in the freedom of the glory of the sons and daughters of God.